Red Dead Redemption 2 is filled with all kinds of Easter eggs, side characters, and complex concepts. So much, in fact, that the relationship between Arthur and someone as seemingly insignificant as two escaped criminals you appear to accidentally run into and then periodically help in subsequent side missions can really have an hour-long video dedicated to that entire situation because it's complex. Why is it so complex? Well, for a few reasons. Arthur runs into these two escaped criminals right in the middle of the game's story where the gang has opted to keep a low profile. They're trying to not cause any trouble and because of the fact they're actually deputized in the near by town of Rhodes, it's obviously an immediate conflict of interest. Then think of Arthur's own background. No, not just his career as a criminal, but what appears to be a pattern of not willing to help anyone else out. And now he chooses to do just that for two grown men he doesn't know. What you fools up to? Is Mr. Black's fault? His fault, the darky white. Well, I don't know why they call him that. Look at him. Don't you start now. I'll knock the color clean off you. Come on. All and right. I'll tell you, you lily living. Enough. Which, one of them being African American in the South at the turn of the 19th century, there has to be some racial element that plays into account there, but you see what I mean? It can get quite complex very quickly. Not just for the situation of Samson Black and Wendell White, the two escaped criminals in question, but deep for the sake of the Vanderlyn gang situation and Arthur's own interest and character development. Maybe we can revisit these two and this topic another time. Let me know if you'd like to, but today I wanted to discuss another character. Another side story and their plight that has left a very long impact on me because she, along with the German family, Mrs. Londonderry, and even the Downs family, are all people that not only would not have survived if it wasn't for Arthur's intervention. I've already discussed Edith and Arthur's situation at length in another video if you want to check that out. Mrs. Londonderry as well. It goes without saying, Arthur wasn't exactly a direct cause to her situation specifically, but he did help her at least by giving her some money to ensure she was able to keep her house and her and her son wouldn't end up homeless. Despite her losing her husband to loan sharks and enforcers like Leopold Strauss and Arthur Morgan, Arthur definitely took a lot of pity, but I'm sure he was ashamed and embarrassed about his actions resulting in these unfortunate situations that so many people found themselves in because of him and Strauss's work. And then we have the German family. I've always wondered if Arthur would have ever helped them at all if it wasn't for Charles. Arthur told this woman and her two kids to leave. He was more concerned with the land they were occupying and had no interest in rescuing their father and husband who has been taken for ransom. As events play out, we know the father is saved by both Charles and Arthur, and he promptly pays Arthur upon his safe return to his family. Come on, now get out of here. This place ain't safe. Get out of here! Yeah, yeah, Vamos! Vamos! Uh, I have something for you. One moment. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you. Vielen Dank, herzlichen Dank. I guess it was a pleasure. As life, or rather I guess I should say as the crazy events of this game plays out, later on while Arthur succumbs to a coughing fit, he passes out. Only to wake up in the custody of the German family he was more than willing to forsake so long ago. They found him nearly suffocating during his own coughing fit and decided to take him in, nurse him back to health, which he promptly denied when he came to. Please, drink, drink this. <laughs> Just a minute. Wenn ich besser Englisch könnte. Sie haben uns gerettet, als wir wirklich Hilfe brauchten. Und jetzt können wir sie nicht retten. Aber, aber. This is yet another mystery. I don't know if Arthur's aware of how exactly tuberculosis works out because the fact that he denies it, I've always took as he just didn't want the help. You know, these are good people. He's a bad man. Throughout the entire game, Arthur always refers to himself as a bad person. Even when he's doing good or trying to do good, it's conditional, or at least in his mind, it's conditional. And then when he's appraised for doing good or for seeing the good in a person and trying to help them, he plays it off. He says he has that person fooled and they don't know him that well. This is just the one time where he's acting out of character. But from his perspective, he isn't worthy of any kind of help. Whether if it's justified or not, he clearly has a negative perception of himself that is quite clear. And I want to clarify that I just said about him not knowing how tuberculosis works. I think it's clear he knows how he contracted it and how it can spread with any kind of coughing or sneezing to someone in close contact. And seeing how the children are right beside his bed with their parents, it could have also just been that he knew he 
can't and shouldn't be around them as he doesn't want to infect any of them. But I do like thinking about it as there's still so much good in this world, so many kind people more than willing to help those in need, and no matter how badly he may need the help right now, it's rejected because in his mind he isn't worthy of it. All these situations and people I've mentioned have some type of asterisk next to them. From the story, we have seen these types of people affected by Arthur's actions, directly or indirectly, by the way he conducted himself before his health began to decline. But what about Charlotte? Charlotte is a widow that Arthur runs into out in the mountains. Arthur finds her stricken with grief and on the brink of starvation, unkept hair, and very dirty. She sits by a graveside weeping and it appears even yelling at her now deceased husband. This was supposed to be our little uh, adventure. You alright there? Who are you? Oh, it's okay ma'am, I don't mean you no harm. <laughs> Well, it makes no difference now if, if an outlaw or a wild animal doesn't get me starvation, well... When I first saw this interaction, I honestly thought Arthur was just going to move on. Which he does at first. He tells her he'll leave her to it, and he's about to go about his way. This is even after she's told him that she can't give up now, despite her mentioning she's from the city. Her tone of self-defeat and realizing the position she is in all betrays she's in over her head. She also denies being taken to a train station or a town to help her out, an invitation she promptly declines and returns her attention to the grave, saying she's going to do this for you, Cal, of course referring to her husband. And then Charlotte also explains that she can't give up now, her husband wouldn't want that, and she also tells Arthur she has no knowledge in terms of hunting or fending for herself, or any means of protection really, she's out here stranded all alone, forced to rely on her wits and her very limited, if any, knowledge in terms of hunting, fishing, or living out in the wilderness in general. In this first meeting, Arthur takes it upon himself to train her how to skin and how to hunt. I've always loved this first interaction because it's different for so many different ways. Not only is it at a very critical moment where Arthur's having not so much a crisis within his own personal identity, but he's now seeing his health decline, his family start to rip apart and fracture, and he's starting to project or do more good in the world, at least obviously if you're doing the more honorable ending, and that is what Arthur's doing. But not only that, the whole hunting section was almost a full circle of sorts. Throughout the beginning of the game, Arthur isn't really seen as a gifted or very talented hunter. Dutch, Hosea have joked how Arthur has practically obliterated rabbits and everything else that he's come across with shotguns. He doesn't have that delicate touch of hunting with a bow. It's not until Charles teaches him and Charles explains to him the whole purpose of being up and down winds that way animals don't catch your scent and that you move a certain way and you learn how to track and how to pick up certain clues within the environment to really hone in the prey that you're hunting so he was never really seen as the go-to guy to hunt yet here he is taking someone under his wing and teaching them the knowledge that he has while it may not be perfect, it at least is going to be able to suffice to ensure that this person, Charlotte, is capable of living on her own, of ensuring that she can actually find something to eat, to skin it properly, and get it to a place where she's able to cook and eat it. In a way, it's also a nice, peaceful moment. Keep in mind, Charlotte's entire situation, her being stranded, left alone, is at a point in time where the events of the gang is all coming to a head. Dutch is going more and more off the rails. You're caught in the middle of the feud between the Wapiti Indians, the United States Army, Dutch making the entire situation worse while still trying to keep the peace between Dutch and John, try to get John to realize that he just needs to move on, helping Sadie. Arthur is in the middle of a whirlwind of emotions. And then of course, his own declining health. He's constantly pulled in every single direction. There's no moment to relax. And here in this moment, not only is he able to help someone, to do this kind gesture to ensure that they're able to survive on their own. But this whole walk where he's talking to Charlotte and telling her how lucky she's at, the position that she's in next to this water, to be able to fish, and all the wildlife that's going to be coming to and from, basically just telling her that in spite of these daunting challenges she's facing with the dead husband and the fact that she really doesn't know how to hunt or fish, she's very lucky given the spot that she's in in terms of the wildlife traffic and the environment. Naturally, Charlotte really doesn't think anything of it, but it seems to be somewhat uplifting for at least Arthur to be able to focus his energy on someone else, to be able to, to help this person in a way where it doesn't cost someone else's life, where it doesn't cost some bigger ramifications that you really need to weigh out on whether if it is good or if it is bad or what's going to happen after everything else. He's able to 
just help someone for the sake of helping someone. Something he hasn't been able to do in a very long time, if ever at all. The next time we come across Charlotte, she has found a new sense of hope. She's still dirty and visibly unkept, however, she has some newfound resolve. No longer starving, she's now determined more than ever to make this life out in the wilderness work. Here, Arthur completes his previous lesson and now takes the time to teach Charlotte how to properly use a gun. We find her struggling to use her husband's rifle and even naively points the barrel up towards her chin, which Arthur smoothly corrects. Time I learned how to use Cal's gun properly. Well, how's that working out for you? Well, let's just say my prey is looking decidedly unscathed. <laughs> but the end of labor is to gain leisure. Is that not what Aristotle said? No, oh, I, I don't know much about Aristotle, but... Um... Well, I know a thing or two about shooting a gun. Look, you gotta hold steady and firm. Hmm? While not as long as an interaction as the first, the second one is yet again one that is very peaceful. Arthur teaches her the one thing he knows best, how to handle a firearm. And the lesson concludes with them retreating into her cabin to enjoy the rest of the rabbit Arthur helped her capture a few days ago. While the initial interaction between these two showed a new and kinder Arthur, this one more so resembles the dynamic of their relationship. Well, they sit down to enjoy a nice meal, one that's even more calming by Charlotte opening up about her misinformed dreams of how she would live her life. Out here in the beautiful untamed wilderness, Arthur slowly begins to struggle to breathe. Even if Rockstar didn't apply the red hue filter to imply Arthur's impending episode, the look in his face of the laborious breathing he's having says it all. Yet again, another moment where someone tells him that he's a nice, kind man that he swiftly denies. You're a good man. Oh, you don't really know me. His very punishment and reminder of everything that he's done throughout his life, thus reinforcing that negative perception of himself that no, he's not a kind or good man. Arthur goes to excuse himself, but he blacks out, succumbs to yet another coffin fit. Well, I'm, I'm fine. I just, um... <coughs> Thank you for this. I think it's it's best if I if I make stay right there. It's it's gonna be okay. No matter how much he does or how hard he tries to save others, he can't save himself. These relaxing moments of just sitting and eating dinner peacefully, a simple pleasure for most, is now a luxury that he won't really ever be able to experience again. Arthur later comes to inside of Charlotte's home. There's a note from her beside him, expressing her gratitude and for all that he's done, and with it, some cash as a small thank you. In the letter, Charlotte also mentions that she's gone to go hunting. She not only has the tools and knowledge required to survive, but thanks to Arthur, she also has the confidence to do it too. A job well done. There's one final time we meet Charlotte, and in this final interaction, Arthur is decidedly looking a whole lot worse. What's intriguing is, besides just how he looks, his voice says it all. Yes, his voice was already raspy, gritty, a little harsh, but over the interactions from the first to the second to the third, his voice gets a lot more coarser, much harsher. It's clear his tuberculosis has taken a toll on his body, yet here Charlotte's looking the exact opposite. She looks happy, she looks healthy, she's clean again. It's the first time we see her in such a pristine state and Arthur even mentions it. My, my, I was wondering when I was gonna see you again. You look... <clears throat> Different. Well, the rigors of simplicity take their toll on a woman. Oh, no, I didn't mean well, it. Like... I know. Things are going well. I couldn't have done it without you. Oh, you did it all yourself. <coughs> so how are you holding up? Uh, I'm still standing, which is an improvement on the last time you saw me. I wish that there was something else that I could do. Ma'am, you have done more than enough. Please, call me Charlotte. Arthur. Arthur Morgan. Well, you take care of yourself, Arthur. After all this time, they finally exchange names. It's clear to everyone, Charlotte was only able to survive thanks to Arthur's help. It's so clear in fact that if you don't stay and help during the first interaction, later if you return to Charlotte's cabin, you can find her corpse. So yes, she was going to die without Arthur's help, but in terms of strictly looking at it from Arthur's perspective and everything going on around him, his time spent with Charlotte is a way to show us how there is sadly no way of saving Arthur. 
He can change now and help as many people out as much as he'd like, regardless if he knew their names or not and decided to take pity on them or not or whatever. His time here is nigh on done. This peace he finds with Charlotte, who he clearly holds in high regard and has, if not a soft spot for her, then he clearly has a high level of respect for her. But the peace that you're able to find in showing her how to hunt, how to shoot, how to be self-sufficient, hits twice as hard in the gut when he has these coughing episodes when you see his health go down and even someone like Charlotte who doesn't know him personally but is so grateful and has so much to owe because of his help can't even help him he's long gone it's not so much Charlotte herself but it's the time Arthur spends with her going through the things that he's learned throughout his years from the hunting the skinning of animals learning how to fire a weapon passing that knowledge on to someone else while we're reminded constantly that he doesn't have much time left is the very reason why these small series of side stories or side quests have always stuck with me and have been honestly the more memorable ones when it came to some of the side characters throughout the entire story of Red Dead Redemption 2. But let me know what you think down in the comment section below. What's your position on Charlotte and Arthur, the relationship and how everything else plays out within this entire time frame? Do you agree with what I said or am I completely off? I'd love to hear your thoughts, but till next time, I'll see you all later.